Chapter 5 April 19, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 We're camped on the Republican River tonight, and tomorrow, we will try to make it to the Big Blue. The worry is that we won't be able to make it the whole way and will have to camp without the benefit of water, which means there will be little wood as well. The hope is that we can make the drive between rivers in one day, and we won't have to start burning buffalo chips, though we know that will be part of our journey before the end. I don't want to think of what it would be like to have to collect them, but I think that will be the children's job when it's time. They need to have chores on the trail, just like we do. They gather wood now, so they would be the ones to gather buffalo chips later. It is strange being a married woman. I look at Bob and wonder how I ended up as his wife, and then I remember it was my father's doing. He is a good man, and he's not tried to order me around at all, but I'm sure that is coming. It seems to be what marriage is all about after all. I look at this man and I know that he is a good one. I do. I just don't know if I want to have babies as often as it looks like I will have to. I want my freedom to hunt and to work with the animals. I do not want to have to do so with a child attached to my breast, but I will if necessary. I'm not going to give up. Mary settled herself on the ground, ready for sleep. She was thankful that Bob had agreed to not consummate the marriage, because she couldn't stop thinking of the look on a cow's face when she was mounted and bred. It wasn't something she had ever intended to see, but it was definitely part of farm life. No, it would be much easier now that Bob was ready to just settle down and sleep. The man seemed to have marital relations too much on his mind anyway. The act couldn't be as wonderful as he seemed to think it would be. She was surprised when Bob removed his clothes before getting under the covers with her, but she had never really noticed how he slept before. When he joined her, he pulled her close to him, and her head rested on his bare shoulder, which was very nice. She liked the feel of his skin against her cheek. His hands smoothed over her back, and that was lovely as well. She was surprised at how very much she enjoyed it when Bob touched her. It simply felt good. After a moment of his hands roaming over her back, he tilted her chin up, and he kissed her, more passionately than ever before. His tongue touched hers, and she gasped before wrapping her arms around him and kissing him back. It was different kissing with him naked, because she enjoyed the feel of his skin so much. When Bob's hand came around to cup her breast, she moaned softly. That felt very good. All at once, she wanted his hand right against her breast, and not through the fabric of her dress. She reached behind her and unbuttoned her dress so that he would have better access to her skin. His hand immediately slipped inside, and he rolled her nipple between her fingertips. That feels so good, she whispered to him. I'm glad. I want to touch you as well. May I? He smiled and nodded. Mary was a passionate girl, as long as she wasn't worried about cows, and he could feel her passions rising more by the moment. Please touch me wherever you want. He was surprised, though he wasn't certain why he would be, when her hand immediately went to his erection. She took it in her hand and stroked it, and then her finger was running over the head of it. He groaned loudly. Mary obviously took that as an invitation to stroke it more. Mary was surprised at how very hard and thick his penis was. The bull penises she'd seen had been very different. She wanted her body to be closer to it, but she was still wearing her dress and petticoats. It was dark, so she stood up quickly and removed the dress before lying down beside him again. She pressed herself against him, loving the feel of his penis against her. She initiated the next kiss, and it was her tongue that was the aggressor. Bob smiled against her lips, knowing that his plan was working, just as he'd hoped. He'd wanted her to lie down and lose her inhibitions, and she had. He moved his hand down to the junction of her thighs, and he stroked her right there, where his body wanted to join with hers. When she gasped and rolled to her back, spreading her legs to give him better access, he wanted to laugh aloud. 
The girl, who minutes before was too afraid for this to happen, was practically begging him to make love to her now. He carefully slid one finger inside her and tried to bring her to the same level of passion he himself was feeling. It didn't take long. When his mouth went to her breast and caught her nipple between his lips, she cried out. I need something. He added a second finger, stroking both of them in and out of her tight depths. How's that? he asked softly, his voice muffled by her breast. That's not it, I don't know what I need. He rolled atop her and carefully poised himself at the edge of her canal. He reached one hand down to guide himself to her and gently started breaching her body. Mary gasped as she stared up at him, just then realizing what was happening. He was making love with her, and he had tricked her into not thinking about cows. At the moment, she just couldn't care though, because what he was doing was making her feel so good. Why had Hannah not told her it was this wonderful? And then she felt a short flash of pain, and she wanted to yell, but he held still for a while, kissing her and stroking her. When he started moving again, she realized she really liked this thing he was doing with her. She only wished it didn't have the consequence of babies. When they were finished, he rolled to her side, and she rolled with him, her head pillowed on his shoulder. I won't worry about whether the heifer liked it anymore, she said softly. I'm glad you're not worried about the cows. I was afraid we'd spend the rest of our lives with you arguing with me and telling me the heifer didn't like it. Bob couldn't help but grin. There was something very special about Mary that made him always smile. Now do we sleep? Or do we run back into camp naked as jaybirds and show them what we did? I think sleep is the best option. I don't want any of the other men to see what they're missing by letting me be the one to marry you. Bob couldn't help but grin at her question. His Mary was something else, and so much more than anyone else realized. She giggled a little as her eyes started to drift closed. It was a good wedding day, Bob. It was. Now we just have to make sure every day of our marriage is good. Mary nodded, not really caring what he'd said. It was time for her to sleep. Asterisk. The next day, the camp moved along the Republican River, some more, a place where they'd camped for a few days. It was hard for her to remember just how many, because she'd been busy being courted by Bob. And planning a wedding with her mother. And worrying about cows. When she first joined Hannah for the walk, she was a bit embarrassed that her friend knew what she'd been doing, but it was pretty obvious that her friend wasn't wanting to talk about it either. I hope there's nothing keeping us from moving today, Hannah said. It seems like we've started to have accidents and wagon trouble. We even started an hour late today because the livestock wandered away during the night. I just wish everything would run smoothly for a few days. Mary shrugged. I think most of us feel that a journey like this will have those things. Everyone but Captain Bedwell, Hannah replied. The entire camp had been starting to get annoyed with Captain Bedwell and his adherence to scheduling. Two more people had fallen ill during the trip, and he'd refused to wait even a few hours to leave camp. No one in his family had been sick yet, so perhaps that was why. As they walked, the three Henderson children, both of the Balling children, and five of Mary's younger siblings walked with them. The Henderson children were quite subdued, having just lost their mother a week before. The Balling children had lost their father more than six months before, and they had mostly returned to being normal boisterous children. The Mitchell children were a different matter entirely. All of them would leave the trail to explore and they didn't care if they were within sight of Hannah and Mary. They were treating this as an adventure. The captain let them stop for the noon meal, which was good because they had to bury another of their own. This was an unmarried man who few had much contact with and the tears were less this time. Hannah, once again, cried more than anyone else in camp. Mary was surprised. She seemed so strong, and yet she was the most emotional when there was a death. Mary knew the man, 
and had even interviewed him for a possible husband, but he'd grown sick shortly afterward and died quickly. That was the problem with cholera. You could be perfectly healthy one minute and in your grave four hours later. Dwight Warner was from New Jersey, and he'd sold a farm and everything he owned, kissing his parents and sisters goodbye to go west and get some real land for himself. Mary wondered if the pastor or the captain would be writing a letter back to his parents to let them know of his demise, but then her mind again flitted to the next thing. Calming Hannah We've lost two people from our train, both of them healthy people. Now we're down two healthy people. How do we think we're going to survive months and months on this trail when healthy people are dying? Hannah asked, as tears streamed down her face. Mary smiled at her friend. We're going to survive. I can just feel it in my bones. Well, I hope your bones will speak to my heart, and there will be no more worry about death along this trail. I don't know why it's called the Oregon Trail. Wouldn't the trail of death be more apt? Hannah shook her head. I'm healthy. Jed is healthy. My friends on the trail are healthy. I need to look at the good and not the bad. Mary nodded. You certainly don't need to get as upset as we all know you're capable of getting. She was worried with every death because of how upset Hannah got. This time did seem to be a bit easier though. They traveled two hours longer than anyone had expected that night because they'd taken an extra hour to dig a grave and they'd started an hour early. And everyone knew the captain was not going to let them slow down. Not one little bit. For supper, families worked together that evening. Mary made enough biscuits to feed an army, while her mother cooked up some buffalo pieces. She made a pot of stew big enough for five families, and many shared their food rather than making something fresh. Margaret was one who ate with them, being too tired to make something to feed herself and her children. Mary worried about her having to do double work the whole way, but her friend never complained. As they all gathered around, Mr. Scott prayed over the meal. Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you for this food you have provided. We lost another of our own today, and we mourn his loss. Please wrap your arms around him when you receive him, and make sure that he knows we have not forgotten him here on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There was a chorus of amens throughout the group, and they all ate, but most ate with somber looks on their faces. Losing two on the trail in less than a month seemed like too many to most of them. Mary noticed Hannah and her husband walking off away from the group, and she knew that the pastor was helping Hannah work through the intense sorrow she felt with every death on the trail. She watched them until they disappeared from view, thinking that she wished she had the answers for her friends, but no one really did. The sadness that came with death was one that no one could explain or alleviate. She didn't know if it would always be that way, but it was a sadness then. Mary walked to Bob, wondering if she should try to help others, but she decided she could let herself mourn that evening. I'm going to help Ma with the dishes, and then you and I can go off and find a private place to talk. Talk? I hope that's a special name for something I'd rather do with you. Bob smiled at her, caressing her cheek. He was thrilled that she'd enjoyed lovemaking as much as she had, and he couldn't wait for darkness to fall, so they could enjoy each other again. I suppose it is. She smiled at him over her shoulder as she walked away and went to help her mother with the dishes. She knew Bob only wanted marital relations from her, and now that she'd experienced them, she certainly couldn't blame him. First, though, she needed to help her mother. Together, she and her mother did the dishes, and she was silent as her mother ranted about the dangers of the trail. Two of your siblings injured in accidents. Two outside of our family dead and another ill. How we'll ever survive this trip from hell, I will never know. Mary looked at her mother with shock for a moment. She never used any curse words, but she had just mentioned hell. Are you all right, Ma? Sure, I'm fine. I'm not worried at all. If all my children die, then I can just have more. 
It's not hard on me to have lots and lots of babies. Let's have another dozen. That'll work, right? Ma was flicking soap and water in the air as she spoke, and it was obvious nothing was going to calm her down quickly. She was in a full-fledged rant, and she needed to get it out of her system. Mary rested her head on her mother's shoulder for a moment. I love you, Ma. And she did. She loved her mother more than she could ever express. Though she didn't much like helping with the women's chores that her mother was in charge of. When her mother turned to her, she had tears in her eyes. Thank you for saying that, Mary. That's exactly what I needed to hear. We all need those words sometimes. I'm still working with you to make sure we don't lose any of ours. I promise I'm watching the little ones just as well as I can. I do hope we won't. Ma returned to washing the dishes, and when they were finished, she waved Mary off. You go on and have fun with your bob. I'll be here, waiting for more to get the cholera. Just make sure they keep drinking coffee, Ma. That's what Doc says keeps them from getting so sick. Even the little ones needed to drink coffee and not something else. It didn't make sense to Mary why they were doing it, but they would follow the doctor's orders to the letter. Ma nodded, not questioning anything. She'd had her entire family on coffee since the beginning of the trip. I make sure of it. When Mary got to Bob, she was mentally exhausted. We can't keep losing people. Ma is about to lose her mind. She rubbed the back of her neck, wishing there was some way to alleviate her mother's fears, but short of turning around and going home, there was no way to do that. Bob frowned at her, fetching a blanket and taking her hand to walk out into the prairie with her. I don't know what we can do about it. I don't either. We have to make certain she's safe from more accidents or injuries. Mary shook her head. I'm sorry. We have to make sure the family is safe from those things. Mother doesn't worry about her own life. She worries about those she loves. I understand. I don't know how we can make sure everyone is fine though. This is a dangerous undertaking, and no one is truly safe as long as they are going to Oregon on this trail. I know that. My mother knows that. It's why she's worried. It's why she forced Pa to wait two years longer than he wanted to for us to go. Mary shrugged. Two years longer than I wanted to wait as well. I wish we were already there, homesteading. She was ready to start her new life, and this torturous walk was not an adventure to her as much as it was a necessity. But if you'd gone two years ago, you never would have met me, and you have to admit, I'm your very favorite husband in all the world. He winked at her as he said it, hoping to make her laugh, which he's succeeding in doing. I do believe you're right about that, Mr. Hastings. She rubbed the back of her neck again, wishing there was a way to get her mother to stop worrying. But she had no idea how. Perhaps we should do a little hunting tonight. It will get my mind off the deaths in camp and my mother's worries. Bob shrugged. We can do that, but I thought we were going to sleep. We will. Just let me get a deer or a bear or something first. I need to feel like I'm doing all I can to keep the camp alive. He didn't want to hunt, but he wanted to do all he could to keep her happy, and if hunting would ease her mind, then he was happy to do it with her. The two of them walked out to the north of camp, knowing that the animals there wouldn't have been disturbed by their presence yet. It didn't take long for Mary to hit two antelopes, and they dragged them back to their camp, working together to hang them from a tree. Neither of them said a word as they maneuvered the animals up and Mary realized the two of them took care of animals the same way they did everything else. They had a silent communication that worked for them. Once they were finished, she walked back to her parents' wagons, finding her mother. I have two antelope bleeding out in the trees near the river. I hope they ease your mind a little. She kissed her mother on the cheek and then disappeared with Bob. She knew what Bob had in mind and she wanted to take just as much time as possible to let it happen. Being married wasn't all terrible. 
there was definitely some intense pleasure involved. She just hoped the babies wouldn't start coming right away. It wasn't time yet. Maybe someday she'd be ready to have babies with Bob, but it would be after their homestead was profitable, and not a moment before. Asterisk. They started early the following morning and went later than expected. By the time they reached the Little Blue, they were all exhausted. All Mary wanted to do was collapse in a heap on the ground, but instead, she returned the children with her to their various families, and then she fetched water from the river for the buffalo stew her mother was planning. That evening, everyone worked together on meals, instead of having separate family meals as they usually did. While Ma got the water boiling, Margaret chopped up some of the buffalo for their meal. Hannah peeled carrots and potatoes and chopped them into small pieces. The Henderson children sat quietly waiting for their food while their father helped with setting up the camp. All of the unmarried men came to eat out of Ma's stew pot as well. The help of so many hands made the work light, which thrilled them all. Mary went over to get two bowls of stew when it was done, fully aware that it would be her job to help with the dishes. She sat beside Bob, ready to go to sleep immediately that evening. She was too tired to do anything else. She had just finished eating when she heard the doctor say something to her ma, and she knew immediately it wouldn't go over well. Thank you for the delicious meal, Mrs. Mitchell. The next time one of your children is injured, I'll take extra good care of them. Mary hurried over and added some cool water to the dishwater Ma had been boiling while they ate. It's going to be all right, Ma. There won't be any more injuries. Ma glared at Mary. You know as well as I do there will be many more injuries. They need to stop calling this the Oregon Trail and start calling it the Death March. No one in their right mind should be bringing children on this trail. It's going to be a miracle if anyone reaches Oregon alive. Mary rested her head on her ma's shoulder for a minute. I know this is frightening for you, ma. I love you. Sure, I'm fine. I'm not worried at all. If all my children die, then I can just have more. It's not hard on me to have lots and lots of babies. Let's have another dozen. That'll work, right? Ma was flicking soap and water in the air as she spoke, and it was obvious nothing was going to calm her down quickly. She was in a full-fledged rant, and she needed to get it out of her system. Mary rested her head on her mother's shoulder for a moment. I love you, Ma. And she did. She loved her mother more than she could ever express. Though she didn't much like helping with the women's chores that her mother was in charge of. When her mother turned to her, she had tears in her eyes. Thank you for saying that, Mary. That's exactly what I needed to hear. We all need those words sometimes. I'm still working with you to make sure we don't lose any of ours. I promise I'm watching the little ones just as well as I can. I do hope we won't. Ma returned to washing the dishes, and when they were finished, she waved Mary off. You go on and have fun with your bob. I'll be here, waiting for more to get the cholera. Just make sure they keep drinking coffee, Ma. That's what Doc says keeps them from getting so sick. Even the little ones needed to drink coffee and not something else. It didn't make sense to Mary why they were doing it, but they would follow the doctor's orders to the letter. Ma nodded, not questioning anything. She'd had her entire family on coffee since the beginning of the trip. I make sure of it. When Mary got to Bob, she was mentally exhausted. We can't keep losing people. Ma is about to lose her mind. She rubbed the back of her neck, wishing there was some way to alleviate her mother's fears, but short of turning around and going home, there was no way to do that. Bob frowned at her, fetching a blanket and taking her hand to walk out into the prairie with her. I don't know what we can do about it. I don't either. We have to make certain she's safe from more accidents or injuries. Mary shook her head. I'm sorry. We have to make sure the family is safe from those things. 
mother doesn't worry about her own life. She worries about those she loves. I understand. I don't know how we can make sure everyone is fine though. This is a dangerous undertaking, and no one is truly safe as long as they are going to Oregon on this trail. I know that. My mother knows that. It's why she's worried. It's why she forced Pa to wait two years longer than he wanted to for us to go. Mary shrugged. Two years longer than I wanted to wait as well. I wish we were already there, homesteading. She was ready to start her new life, and this torturous walk was not an adventure to her as much as it was a necessity. But if you'd gone two years ago, you never would have met me, and you have to admit, I'm your very favorite husband in all the world. He winked at her as he said it, hoping to make her laugh, which he's succeeding in doing. I do believe you're right about that, Mr. Hastings. She rubbed the back of her neck again, wishing there was a way to get her mother to stop worrying. But she had no idea how. Perhaps we should do a little hunting tonight. It will get my mind off the deaths in camp and my mother's worries. Bob shrugged. We can do that, but I thought we were going to sleep. We will. Just let me get a deer or a bear or something first. I need to feel like I'm doing all I can to keep the camp alive. He didn't want to hunt, but he wanted to do all he could to keep her happy, and if hunting would ease her mind, then he was happy to do it with her. The two of them walked out to the north of camp, knowing that the animals there wouldn't have been disturbed by their presence yet. It didn't take long for Mary to hit two antelopes, and they dragged them back to their camp, working together to hang them from a tree. Neither of them said a word as they maneuvered the animals up, and Mary realized the two of them took care of animals the same way they did everything else. They had a silent communication that worked for them. Once they were finished, she walked back to her parents' wagons, finding her mother. I have two antelope bleeding out in the trees near the river. I hope they ease your mind a little. She kissed her mother on the cheek and then disappeared with Bob. She knew what Bob had in mind, and she wanted to take just as much time as possible to let it happen. Being married wasn't all terrible. There was definitely some intense pleasure involved. She just hoped the babies wouldn't start coming right away. It wasn't time yet. Maybe someday she'd be ready to have babies with Bob, but it would be after their homestead was profitable, and not a moment before. Asterisk. They started early the following morning and went later than expected. By the time they reached the Little Blue, they were all exhausted. All Mary wanted to do was collapse in a heap on the ground, but instead, she returned the children with her to their various families, and then she fetched water from the river for the buffalo stew her mother was planning. That evening, everyone worked together on meals, instead of having separate family meals as they usually did. While Ma got the water boiling, Margaret chopped up some of the buffalo for their meal. Hannah peeled carrots and potatoes and chopped them into small pieces. The Henderson children sat quietly waiting for their food while their father helped with setting up the camp. All of the unmarried men came to eat out of Ma's stew pot as well. The help of so many hands made the work light, which thrilled them all. Mary went over to get two bowls of stew when it was done, fully aware that it would be her job to help with the dishes. She sat beside Bob, ready to go to sleep immediately that evening. She was too tired to do anything else. She had just finished eating when she heard the doctor say something to her ma, and she knew immediately it wouldn't go over well. Thank you for the delicious meal, Mrs. Mitchell. The next time one of your children is injured, I'll take extra good care of them. Mary hurried over and added some cool water to the dishwater Ma had been boiling while they ate. It's going to be all right, Ma. There won't be any more injuries. Ma glared at Mary. You know as well as I do there will be many more injuries. They need to stop calling this the Oregon Trail and start calling it the Death March. No one in their right mind should be bringing children on this trail. It's going to be a miracle if anyone reaches Oregon alive. Mary rested her head on her ma's shoulder for a minute. 
I know this is frightening for you, Ma. I love you. As angry as her Ma was, she never once raised her voice. We never should have brought the babies. Never. I spent years pregnant with your siblings, and you. Years. And all of those years are going to be lost, with a six-month trek through hell. I'll get better about watching the little ones, Mary promised. I won't take my eyes off them. Of course, you will. You're a newly married young woman, and you love nothing better than to hunt. Ma shook her head, waving Mary away with her hand. Go. Do something else. I'll handle the dishes, or Hannah can do them with me. Don't spend your last minutes on this earth washing dishes, when there is no woman alive who hates women's work as much as you do. Mary walked away, well aware that Bob followed her out of the circle of wagons to behind them. When he reached for her, she slapped his hand away. Don't touch me. You want me to have babies so we can kill them too. It's not happening. Do you hear me? Bob looked at her in shock. What's this about, Mary? Bob understood he wasn't perfect, and he was willing to have her call him down when his own behavior was bad, but it hadn't been, and he had no idea what was upsetting her so much. What's this about? This is about men telling women what to do whenever they want. It's about men being in charge of the entire world, because that's how it's always been. Well, this woman has a mind of her own, and she plans to use it. Do you understand that? He stared at her for a moment. I've never told you to do something you didn't want to do. I don't think you're angry with me right now, Mary. If you are, I'd sure like to understand why. Mary took a deep breath. You're right. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at my father, and you're standing in front of me, so you're getting the brunt of it. Why are you mad at your father? He asked, truly trying to understand what was going on with her. Because he forced my mother to come on this trip and bring my younger brothers and sisters. She begged him not. Chapter 6 April 21, SUP ST, slash SUP, 1852 Today was a sad day indeed. We are traveling along the Little Blue River until we get close enough to the Platte River to make the journey in a day. We're doing everything possible to always stop at a river, where there will be more animals to hunt, water for our needs, and wood to make our fires. Mrs. Bedwell has been under the weather for most of the trip. You could see in her eyes even before we left that this trip would be much harder on her than it would be on most of us, but her husband was determined to drag her and their sons along the way. This afternoon, Mrs. Bedwell was feeling ill and she told her husband she would need to ride once again. The captain was not pleasant to her, and we all heard him chastising her and telling her she was making it harder on the oxen who had to drag her along with everything else. So, she walked with the rest of us, which she was rarely able to do because of her frailty. None of us really knew what was wrong with her, but she wasn't strong enough to walk. Most of us know to stick to the trail, because there are snakes and all sorts of creepy crawly creatures in the grass. Unfortunately, when I told Mrs. Bedwell she would be better off walking on the trail, she turned to me in anger and told me it was none of my never mind what she wanted to do. I've never seen the woman angry before, but I backed away. It's always the little women who look so sweet who have a real temper. Not ten minutes later, I heard a rattle, but by then, she'd already been bitten. Apparently, she stepped on the rattler. He was slithering away, so I shot him to keep him from getting anyone else, but it was too late for Mrs. Bedwell. She was on the ground in moments. Hannah yelled to stop the train, and the relay was heard quickly across the entire company. The captain was angry to stop, and he came back, full of vinegar as he asked who'd called for the stop. I simply pointed at his wife on the ground, who was already unconscious. Hannah was kneeling beside her with her shawl tucked under Mrs. Bedwell's head. The captain screamed for the doctor, who came rushing back, but by then, she was dead. By not caring how ill his wife was to begin with, 
and by not paying attention to her need to ride in the wagon, he allowed his sweet wife to die. He knelt at her head for a moment, his head tilted downward. When he lifted it, tears could be seen in his eyes, but his face was solemn. He called for a grave to be dug, and we camped by his wife's beloved body for the night. He knows he caused her death. There is no doubt in anyone's mind. Mary went hunting after the early stop and funeral that afternoon. She needed some time alone. Two days in a row she'd seen women upset over the way they were ordered around by men. This time, she didn't wait for her husband, but went out alone. Soon after she left the camp, she heard Hannah running after her. I just need to walk with you, Hannah said, her face covered in tears. Where's your husband? Mary knew that it was really her husband that Hannah needed when she grew so upset. He had a way of calming her that Mary had no inkling of. He's talking to Captain Bedwell. The captain needs him more than I do at the moment. That's probably true, Mary said. I just need to kill something and pretend it's all men. Hannah looked at her with surprise. Are you upset with Bob? Bob? Of course not. Who could be upset with Bob? She shook her head. No, I'm angry with all men who think they have a right to make decisions for their wives. Men who don't take anyone else's feelings into account when they decide what's best for their families. Men like my father and the good captain. Because your father made your mother come on this trip? Hannah asked, obviously trying to understand. Yes. Ma is going to sleep crying every night. Do you know that she was upset last night when the doctor told her he'd take special care with her next child who was injured on the trail and thanks for his meal? Ma's biggest fear is to lose one of her children on the trail. Not me, so much, because I'm grown. But the others. She's had two injured already, and she's certain she's going to lose all of us. She is calling the trail a death march. Mary shook her head, desperately wanting to be able to help her mother. I can see that. Hannah shook her head. I'll be more understanding and try to stay close to her. Better than that, help me keep a special eye out for my siblings. Maisie spends a lot of time walking now, and she wanders away so fast. Ma has to ride with Jeremiah and Annie, the first two injured. Mary shook her head, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw what she'd watched for the whole trip. Two buffalo drinking from the river. They were cut off from the rest of the herd. She had one chance to bring one down and she was finally going to do it. Carefully, she raised her musket to her shoulder, and she sighted the male of the pair. With one shot, the buffalo was on his knees. With the second, he was down, and the other buffalo had run off. Mary looked at Hannah and squealed. I did it. I got my first buffalo. She carefully set her musket down and hugged her friend, letting her go and spinning in a circle. I just fed our entire camp for days. I got a buffalo. Why she felt it was such a huge accomplishment, she didn't know, but to her it was something magical. Hannah laughed. You did great. Now we have to get some men to help us move said buffalo into the camp. It's going to take a lot of manpower. And I can't celebrate my buffalo kill, because Mrs. Bedwell died a short while ago, but I know you understand. Mary would have to be calm as she told people about the buffalo when she wanted to sing it from the rooftops or the treetops, wherever she could sing it from. I do. I'm always here to understand whatever you say. Hannah stood for a moment grinning at Mary when they saw Bob and Jamie running toward them. Bob's face was full of fear. Are you all right, Mary? Mary nodded, pointing to the buffalo lying on the ground not far from them. I finally got one. Mary had killed more animals than everyone else in their wagon train put together. It was truly a shock that she hadn't been the first to get a buffalo. Bob smiled. I'm proud of you. Now I get to hack it up and carry it back to camp. 
Go and get more men to help us. Mary and Hannah headed back to camp, and the first man she saw was her pa. She had no desire to talk to him, but it might be a bit fun to give him orders for a change. Pa, I killed a buffalo. Bob and Jamie need help bringing it back. True to his nature, her father glared at her. What have I told you about not killing anything too big for you to bring back to camp? His glare had her angry enough to spit. I just felled an animal big enough to feed the entire company for the next few days. And here you are, complaining that I can't bring it back on my own? Did you say that to the pastor when he brought a buffalo down? Mary said nothing else as she turned and walked back toward camp, refusing to even look at her father. She didn't care how angry he was. She was no longer his to discipline. Mary and Hannah stopped beside Ma. How can we help, Ma? Mary asked. Was that you shooting something? Her mother asked. It was. I got my first buffalo. Mary did her best not to let pride enter her voice because she knew her mother was anything but proud of her shooting skills. That'll keep us all fed for a while. Her mother said nothing else, but Mary hadn't expected her to. Could I help you make supper? She asked. Ma shook her head. No, you go play a game with the children. They all need to have something fun to do. I'd be happy to do that. Mary would much rather play with the children than help cook. Mary and Hannah went to the children, who were mostly scattered in pairs, doing whatever they wanted. Mary rounded them all up. Let's play a game together. Who knows how to play Simon Says? Me. Most of the children had played the game, but some of the smaller ones had not. Mary briefly explained the game, and they all played for a good long while, keeping the children out of the way while the adults dealt with the captain and burying his wife. When Jed Scott, Hannah's husband, stepped into the clearing where they played, Mary stopped the game. They looked to the preacher to see if he had anything to say to all of them. Instead, he took his wife by the hand and led her away, speaking to her in a low voice. When Hannah returned, her eyes were bright with unshed tears, but she continued the game. Mary was certain Jed had talked to her about how she was taking the death of the third person from their group, and it was obvious Hannah was doing a little better with each one. Mary wasn't certain if that was a good thing or a bad thing. It was never good to not care when someone died, but it was worse to fall apart with every single death. The camp made supper together again that night, and for the first time, the captain and his boys joined the rest of them for a meal. After supper, though they'd had time to rest that day, there was no music or dancing. Everyone was aware of how the captain felt, and they tried to be respectful. There was no need to hunt, because the buffalo Mary had killed earlier would feed them all for a good long while. Instead, they broke into small groups to play cards and Mary and Bob were as good as they'd always been. They played against Hannah and Jed, which Mary enjoyed. It was good to do things with the lifelong friend she'd made in independence. Tomorrow is going to be really hard, Hannah said with a very low voice. The captain's boys will be joining our little entourage of children we're taking along the trail now. She wondered just how many more children she and Hannah could have walked with them without it being too many. I really worry that the captain is going to look at Margaret for a new wife. She would not do well with him, Mary said softly. We need to find a way to keep that from happening. Maybe the captain will look at Trudy Brown. She's the only other unmarried woman on the trail who is truly old enough to marry. I'm sure there will be more down the road, but for now, it's just Trudy. Hannah shrugged. I don't know Trudy nearly as well as I know Margaret, but I think she's strong enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the captain without losing her mind. Mary understood exactly what Hannah was saying. The captain was too bossy for most women, and he needed a wife who would be able to stand up to him. I can see that, Mary said, nodding. If any of us see the captain looking toward Margaret, we need to point him toward Trudy. Agreed? Hannah nodded, 
and reluctantly, the two men nodded as well. Bob had no desire to be involved in putting couples together or in keeping them apart, so it was a bit hard for him, but he agreed. He had no real choice. He wanted to keep his wife happy. Mary and Bob took their tent outside the main circle as had become their habit, and Mary clung to him tightly that night. I worry that something will happen, and I'll lose you. Or you'll lose me. I knew the trail would be filled with trials and death, but I wasn't expecting it to be quite this bad. Bob understood, and he stroked his hand over her hair and her back. We'll be careful. We're both strong, and neither of us is drinking anything but coffee. I know it's going to be different for us. I hope you're right. Asterisk. The next two days were difficult with more people growing sick by the day. Most of the ill people rode in the wagons, and Mary and Hannah stayed away. Hannah's heart was too big, in Mary's opinion, and she watched her friend take food to the sick. Mary was willing to cook for the sick, but she wasn't willing to get close enough to catch what they had, if it was catching, and no one knew for sure. By Saturday night, there had been no more deaths, but there were six people in all who were ill. The captain was still pushing as hard as ever, but he had a sadness in his eyes that hadn't been there before. They knew they would stay over on Saturday night, so the women did the clothes right after supper on Saturday, so they could take the entirety of the Sabbath off work. Mary had her and Bob's clothes hanging with those of her parents and siblings when the music started. Bob came and found her between the wagons as she was finishing up, taking her hand and pulling her to the center of the camp, right in front of the musicians. And they danced. All of Mary's worries seemed to melt away as Bob spun her around the campground. Other people danced, but by then, they knew to watch out for Bob and Mary and their overly boisterous dance moves. By the time the musicians took a break, Mary felt like all of the burdens she had been carrying were lifted from her shoulders. She collapsed onto the grass beside Hannah and breathed a sigh. That Bob sure can dance. Hannah laughed. So, can you? I think everyone in camp is afraid to dance around you, because you never can tell if one of you are going to run over them. Mary laughed. They know to stay out of our way, and that's a very good thing. Of course, it is. Hannah rubbed the back of her neck. I'm so glad it's finally getting warmer. It's going to be May soon. They'd all had to wear coats and shawls on their journey, but soon just sleeves would be enough. We've been on the trail almost a month. Mary shook her head. I think I'm going to do a bit of hunting tomorrow, after the service. Or before the service, since the laundry is already done. I feel like that's my greatest contribution to the company. The meat I can bring in. Hannah shook her head. You have no idea how much of a contribution you make, do you? You walk with children, you cook when you have to, you do laundry. You are a wonderful addition to this company, and it wouldn't be the same without you. Mary smiled at Hannah. You have to say that, because you're my lifelong friend. I don't have to say anything, Hannah retorted. I say what I mean. Are you accusing a preacher's wife of being a liar? Never. God would surely strike me down with a bolt of lightning. The two friends laughed, and Bob looked down at them from where he was talking to Jed. The two men hadn't become quick friends like Mary and Hannah, but they were friendly enough that they enjoyed talking to one another while their women chatted about whatever it was women talked about. What are you two giggling about? Oh, you don't want to know. Suffice it to say, I told Hannah she was fibbing, and she reminded me she's a preacher's wife, and I was looking for the bolt of lightning that was sure to come. Bob and Jed exchanged looks, both of them shaking their heads. You know, Bob, I think if the two of U.S. don't find adjoining homesteads, there will be two very unhappy women in our lives. Bob nodded. That's true. I guess we're stuck with one anther for the rest of our days. Hannah looked at Jed, her eyes filled with happiness. Do you mean it, Jed? 
you'll try to get a lot near theirs? It was a subject Mary and Hannah had joked about since they'd met. Jed nodded, and Mary jumped to her feet and hugged the preacher. He was a bit uncomfortable with it, and Mary could tell so she stepped back quickly and went to hug her own husband. We will be the best behaved wives in all of Oregon if we live close, Mary said. Now who's lying? Hannah asked with a laugh. We'll make more of an effort to be well behaved than we would have, Mary said, grinning. Jed looked at Bob. Any idea what we just got ourselves into? I don't even want to think about it, Bob responded. Margaret walked toward them then, and she sat down beside Hannah. The girls are asleep, so I can play grown up for a short while now. Sounds good to me, Hannah said. Jed and Bob just told us that they'd make an effort to get adjoining homesteads so we can live close. Hannah's face looked just about as excited as Mary felt. Margaret's eyes widened and she nodded emphatically. That's wonderful. Just make sure I'm on another side of the two of you, and I'll be happy right along with you. Absolutely, Hannah agreed. Mary wished Margaret would find love on the trail, and she wouldn't have to bear the burden of homesteading and raising the girls on her own, but she had no doubt Margaret would find a way to do it and do it well. She was a strong woman. When the dancing started again, Mary and Bob were back out there dancing, doing their best to avoid running over their fellow emigrants. There was something about dancing that made both of them lose every single inhibition they'd ever had. When the music slowed a bit, and Mary went happily into Bob's arms, she asked, What would you think of Margaret and the doctor together? Bob shook his head. Nah. Doc is forty if he's a day, and Margaret isn't much older than you. It wouldn't work out well, from what I can see. Doc needs to marry someone closer to his age, or no one at all. Mary nodded, agreeing with her husband, which wasn't something she usually did readily. You're probably right. I just hate the idea of Margaret doing all the work of homesteading on her own. She needs some help. She probably does. All was well when they turned in that night, and Mary looked forward to the smaller workload on the Sabbath. She knew the captain had hired Margaret to do his and the boys' laundry for the rest of the trip, and she was thankful he'd thought to look to her friend. The following morning dawned dark and rainy. As soon as Mary saw the bad weather, she felt like it was a sign of things to come, and unfortunately, she was right. Two more people had died during the night, bringing the death toll of their group to five. Both had died of the cholera, and they each had children they'd left behind. Both had been men. Mary and Hannah clung to one another's hands during the funerals, and they simply ached for the wives who had been left alone with no one to turn to, no one to lean on and nowhere to go but forward. They would be homesteading on their own. Two more of the ladies in their group were alone. Mary earnestly prayed there wouldn't be more deaths, but they already knew better. Her mother had been right when she'd called it a death march. They knew the only way to go was forward, but they also knew there would be more deaths, both disease and accidental. They only hoped they would both arrive in Oregon with their hearts intact. Chapter 7. April 26, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852. I've been married for a week today. So far, Bob is the very best of husbands. The trail has been hard with the deaths and illnesses, but we continue on. There are widows and widowers on the trip who are wondering what they are doing. The loss has felt horrific to those of us who have not lost a loved one. I don't want to think of how bad it would be for those who have. No children have been lost yet, and only my two siblings have experienced accidents that are worth mentioning, so things are not all grim. We stopped a little early yesterday, and we washed clothes in the river right after supper, and then the music and dancing started. Bob and I are a little too energetic on the dance floor, or prairie as the case may be, for most of the others in the company, but we don't care. If they don't want to be trod upon, they should sit down and stay out of our way. There were two funerals this morning, and
and we did those instead of having church service. There are now four more children with only one parent on our train that Hannah and I will attempt to manage during our walks. One family is all sick. They lost their father last night, but the mother is ill as well. They have a boy and a girl, and they are slightly ill, but nothing like their parents. The Stangers may end up leaving their boy and girl for someone else to raise. Tomorrow, we will leave the Little Blue and cross the prairie to the Platte River. The Platte is where a great deal of our journey will be, as we will be following that great river almost into Oregon Territory. We are all excited to see the river that will take us so far and keep us with water and feed for our cattle during this summer. Shortly after the gunshot woke them all on Sunday morning, the news they'd lost two more during the night spread through the camp. No one did well with the news of the deaths, of course, but they all worked together to dig graves and all who were healthy attended the services. Mary and Hannah visited the widows of both of the men who had died during the night and arranged to take the children under their wings for the rest of the trip. I'll make sure you get supper tonight, Hannah said softly. We'll both make sure the clothes are washed, Mary said. Do you want to keep your husband's clothes? Neither wife was at all interested in her husband's clothes going with them. Thankfully one of the wives had a teen boy who was able to drive the wagon for a while. His mother wasn't doing well, and Mary and Hannah sent the dock over after talking to her family. While Mary worked on the laundry of the two families, Hannah worked on cooking meals for both for that evening. Mary hated laundry, but she hated cooking even more, so she would let Hannah cook while she did the laundry of the families. Margaret pitched in some as well, and the laundry was on the line plenty early in the day for it all to dry. The doctor visited with Mary while she was hanging clothes for the Stanger family. Mrs. Stanger is very ill. She and her husband have been drinking water and giving it to their children. I want you to ensure no more water goes into the children or the mother. Hopefully she will be able to make a recovery. Anyone you see drinking water, I want you to say that it could kill them. Just be brutal with the information. They don't need to keep putting their lives in danger because they prefer the taste of water to that of coffee. Does someone need to sit with Mrs. Stanger? Mary asked, envisioning her and Hannah taking turns at the woman's bedside. It would be exhausting, but they were strong and they could do it. No, that's not necessary. She'll either make it through or she won't. The doctor shook his head. I hate having to even say that, but it's the truth. Mary closed her eyes for a moment, trying to gather her wits about her. There had been too many deaths, and she hadn't spoken to her mother yet that day. She knew the older woman would be all but out of her mind, worried about her children. Thank you, doctor. The doctor nodded, and he walked off, seemingly to see to some of the others who had taken ill during their journey. Mary hung the last of the laundry on the line, and then she went over to her mother. The men had dug the holes for the dead and buried them, while the woman had seen to the clothes and cooking. Mary was half afraid as she approached her ma. The woman was getting more upset with each death, no matter if they were connected to her family or not. Hello, ma. Ma turned and looked at Mary. Her eyes looked wild. We're all going to die. Why do we continue to cook and do laundry? There is no way we're going to be able to make it all the way to Oregon without more death. Why are we on this death march? There's free land in Oregon, Ma. This is where we need to go to get it. You're going to find that you're happy when you get west. Happy? I've left my whole family and all of my friends. I'll have to travel for hours instead of minutes to get to the nearest store. And do you think I'll be happier? I'll have four children by the time we arrive instead of nine. I worked hard growing every one of those babies in my body, and for what? To lose them all on this fool trip of your father's. No, I will not be happier there. After talking to her ma, well, really letting her ma yell at her, for a few more minutes, Mary went in search of the doctor. 
She didn't know if he could help, but her mother had crossed the line into hysteria, in Mary's opinion, and she needed any help anyone could give her. The doctor listened to her fears and nodded. I'll see if I can calm her down. He shook his head. Didn't she know how difficult the journey would be? Yes, she did, but Pa insisted it was necessary. She managed to delay the trip by two years, but it still happened, and she's certain it means the whole world is ending for her. Mary wanted to help any way she could, but she was afraid her mother was too far gone. Dr. Bentley nodded. I'm not surprised. Your mother seems like a person who needs to be in a comfortable environment and no friends and family are close by. I do wish men would take their wives' fears into account before they embark on a journey such as this one. Mary headed over to where Hannah was cooking for the families who had lost mothers. I just asked the doctor to go and talk to my mother. She is not handling any of the deaths well. In a different way than you are. She wasn't sure if she'd worded that well enough for her friend to understand. Hannah was saddened by them, but they seemed to be slowly driving her mother insane. Hannah nodded. I think having the doctor talk to her is a good idea. Hopefully he'll have some sort of solution that will calm her down. She seems a little more agitated every day. I'm glad I'm not the only one seeing it. I tried to talk to Pa about it, and he acted like I was losing my mind. I'm not. I'm just worried about my mother. Mary shook her head. Sometimes I want to shoot my own Pa for the way he treats Ma. He doesn't understand her at all. I understand your worry. My mother was worried when I left, but I promised to write to her regularly. I know she will feel better once she receives my first letter and sees that I was alive to write to her. Mary smiled. Our mothers are constantly worried about little things like death. I wonder what's wrong with them. I guess we can say they love us, but maybe there's something else as well. Probably not, Mary said with a smile. Do you need help with the cooking? Hannah bit her lip. Would you mind? I know how much you hate cooking, and I don't want to have to ask you to do some of my chores, simply because you finished yours quickly. You know I don't mind. What do you need? I'm making potatoes and carrots in the fire, and I'll serve this meat with it, Hannah said, nodding to the meat in front of her. Mary knew that while she and Hannah had dealt with some of the crises in the camp, some of the men had shot another buffalo. They tried to only get one at a time, so none of the buffalo went to waste, which would truly be a shame. Would you be willing to make some biscuits to go with the rest of it? We're serving the stangers, the bedwells, and the tandies, as well as Jed and me. Could you possibly make four pans of biscuits? Absolutely. Mary immediately took the ingredients that Hannah had already laid out to use, and the two of them worked together easily. Do you remember we became friends because I taught you to make biscuits? I do remember that. Hannah grinned at Mary. It's only been a few weeks, and I'm not senile yet, but I feel it coming on. Mary laughed, and though the day had started with much difficulty, the two of them working together made everything better. When supper was ready, they took meals to the families who had lost loved ones that day, but they invited the others to Jed and Hannah's wagon for the meal. Captain Bedwell looked both angry and sad at the same time. What did the two of you make for us? he asked. His voice was gruff and angry, but they both knew he was more angry with himself than anyone else. Hannah smiled sweetly, knowing the man was upset about the loss of his wife, and not because she'd cooked for him. We made buffalo steaks, potatoes, carrots, and biscuits. And I have a pot of coffee hot on the fire. The captain nodded. Thank you for cooking for us. He sounded begrudging in his words, but he had to be grateful for what the two women were doing for him and the other families who had suffered so much loss. His boys were with him, and they didn't speak much, obviously still mourning their mother. Margaret was feeding the doctor, Jamie, and the blacksmith, as she had almost every night since they'd left Independence. 
When the meals were finished and the dishes done, Margaret called Mary over. I noticed your ma is having a harder time than usual today. Would she take a bath if I drew one for her? Mary smiled, knowing how much work it was to bring the water from the river and heat it for a bath. You are the very best of friends. She hugged Margaret. I do believe she would. I'll ask her if she'd like one. I think the water would soothe her more than anything else can. Ma was resistant, but when Mary asked her to please do it, she acquiesced. Yes, I'll take a bath, but I don't know why you're so certain it's going to help me. There's nothing wrong with me other than the fact I'm about to lose all of my children on this death march. Mary nodded, leading her mother toward the bathtub that Margaret and Hannah were working on filling. I'll even finish your dishes for you, Ma. That way you don't have to worry about any more work tonight. You can just go to bed with a clear conscience. She was willing to do anything she could to make her mother smile again, but she wasn't sure if it would ever happen. I don't know why you think I'll ever have a clear conscience again. I made my children walk across the country so their pa could make a little more money. I don't know why I deserve to have a bath or any other nice things. I've helped kill my own babies. Mary shook her head. I don't think any of us feel that way, Ma. I certainly don't. I'm thrilled for the opportunities I'll have in the West, and I'm a bit smitten with that Bob I married. Her mother didn't even crack a smile, and she usually would have. When she got to the curtain hung between wagons, Mary helped her mother unbutton her dress. I don't need your help clothing myself, Mary Colleen. I've been dressing myself since long before you were born, and I'll keep doing it even now that you're married and ready to have babes of your own. I'm married, but there will be no babes soon, Ma. I refuse to even think about babies, because I'm not ready for them. Ma shook her head. You're silly as a goose, Mary. I don't know where you get it from, but as I'm practical as the day is long, it must be that father of yours. You know you're going to have babies as well as I do. Mary had noticed her ma had more and more anger building up toward her father, just as she did. She would be glad when they had all reached Oregon happily, and her mother could draw an easy breath again. You let me know if you need your back scrubbed, ma. I'll be off for now. You can't scrub my back, because you're washing my dishes. Mary waved her mother away with a laugh, and she ducked behind the curtain to head to her parents' fire. She washed all of the dishes her mother hadn't yet gotten to, and when her pa joined her, she tried her hardest not to show her anger. Where's your ma? She's having her first proper bath of the trail. I think you'll be happy to have a wife smelling as fresh as a daisy when she gets out of that tub in a short while. Mary wanted to say so many more things, but for the sake of her mother, she kept quiet. I hope she's not paying that bawling woman. She has no business being on the trail without a man to watch out for her. The woman is a burden on everyone in this company. He shook his head, obviously in a bad mood. Well, so was Mary, and she didn't need to hear her pa complaining about her friends. No, she's not, pa. She's a hard worker, and she's making meals, driving her team, doing her own laundry, and taking care of her girls. She's playing the man and the woman in her family, and I don't think any of us can complain about a single thing she's done. Her pa blustered. I don't know why women today think they have the right to act as men do. You think you get to make all the decisions for yourself, but there's your husband, having to clean up your messes. Mary turned to her pa, put her hands on her hips, and asked, What messes is he cleaning up for me? I do more than my share every day. He had to take care of the buffalo you shot when you were off with the preacher's wife the other day. Why should he have to bring the buffalo into camp when you're the one who shot it? Pa, that's my marriage you're worried about now not your own. I would be grateful if you'd pay attention to your own business and leave me alone. There was no way she was going to let him criticize her for letting Bob do things for her. He wanted her doing women's work, but he also wanted her dragging heavy game into camp. 
the man was impossible. He raised his hand to slap her, and Mary refused to cow away from him. Her mother had always avoided his hand, but Mary wasn't afraid to take the blows. Before his hand landed, Bob jumped between them. Mr. Mitchell, you weren't planning to hit my wife, were you? His back was straight, and his voice was filled with anger. It hadn't occurred to Mary that Bob would defend her from her own father. Of course, he shouldn't have needed to defend her. She was my daughter first, and apparently I didn't do a very good job of disciplining her. I'm doing you a favor. Your job where Mary is concerned is done, Mr. Mitchell. I would ask you to report to me if you're unhappy with something she says or does, and I'll handle it in my own way. Which was no way at all. Mary had the right to do as she pleased and say what came to her mind where her father was concerned. Bob wasn't ever going to hit his wife, and he didn't care who knew it. Her pa stood there, flexing his fists for a bit, but then he walked away. Bob turned to Mary. He didn't hit you, did he? Mary shook her head, not sure whether she wanted to thank her husband for saving her from a beating, or yell at him because he felt like he needed to. I can handle my father, you know. But you shouldn't have to. He's not going to anger me too much, because then he'd have two wagons to drive, and no matter how strong and powerful he thinks he is, he wouldn't be able to manage to. Mary smiled, wrapping her arms around her husband's neck. I like the way you think, Bob Hastings. Perhaps being married to you isn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. Bob shook his head. It's time for you to be grateful that I saved you from a life of spinsterhood. He knew she would react to that, and he was glad to see her face light up with amusement. She shouldn't have to worry that her father would beat her when she was married and out of the man's house. Mary's laughter told him he would never receive thanks for that, but it filled him with warmth anyway. She'd just had a tough experience, and she could laugh. There was no one on God's green earth who was quite like Mary. She was a special woman and unique unto herself. What do you say we play cards with the pastor and Hannah tonight, she asked. I think that sounds like a wonderful time. I enjoy being with them. They are my kind of people. Mine too. I never thanked you for agreeing to live adjacent to the pastor and Hannah. You have no idea how much better my life will be if she is living close to me. Mary kissed him quickly. Thank you. Bob smiled. Yes, I do. I see your fondness for her. And for Mrs. Balling as well, but you and Hannah have a special closeness. She's the sister of your heart. Mary grinned. You sure are a sap, Bob. The sister of my heart indeed. But she knew Bob was right. Hannah was the only person who she wanted as a sister more than the ones she already had. Hannah was important to her, and she knew their friendship would last the test of time. Asterisk. The following day began the long walk from Little Blue to the Platte River. Mary was pleased to see that her brother Jeremiah was well enough to walk for a while in the morning before he had to return to the wagon for the afternoon. His foot was healing nicely and it had not become putrid, which was the biggest worry. They stopped for a 30-minute meal at noon, needing to press on to make sure they didn't have to camp without water that night. Any other captain would have simply camped in the middle, and they could all see where many companies had stopped in the past, but Captain Bedwell didn't think it was a good idea. Sometimes Mary felt like he was pushing them much too hard, and sometimes she was thrilled that he was going to get them there before winter. At lunchtime, she pressed biscuits into all of the children's hands, and they ate them greedily. Captain Bedwell's younger son, Albert, had a miserable time that afternoon. He cried several times for his mother, but Mary was afraid to go to the captain. She had no idea what he would do. He didn't seem like the most compassionate of fathers. Instead, she and Hannah played a game with the children. She told the beginning of a story, and then Hannah told the next part, and they gave each child a turn to tell a little more of the story. 
Between them, they were all laughing by the time the train stopped for the afternoon, and Mary and Hannah felt like they had done their duty, making the little children laugh. When the Platte River Valley came into view, Mary held her finger out and pointed to the place where they were headed, and the children started cheering. Before long, they could hear the cheers from the entire wagon train, all of them happy to see the river they had heard so much about. It meant they would soon be able to stop for the day, which was good, because everyone was exhausted. That was the first night that everyone just cooked together. There seemed no point in breaking up into groups to cook any longer, because with as many deaths as they'd had, it was simply easier for them to make a huge pot of stew for everyone. One of the children complained they'd had stew too often, and Mary gave him a look. It's that or beans every night. Which would you rather? The boy frowned. Stew, please. It was one of Captain Bedwell's boys, and both Hannah and Mary felt like they were just waiting for trouble from the boys. They felt that they were more important than the others because their father was captain, and it was hard to tell them differently. After the supper dishes were done that evening, Mary wandered over to find Bob, wanting time alone with him. The man she'd been so angry to have to marry had ended up being the one person in the world who could make her happy whenever she was sad. He was a good man, and she was glad her father had forced the wedding. As they walked, Mary talked about her day with the children, and Bob talked about the drive. Your father told me to be more respectful this morning but I told him I felt like I already give him more respect than he deserves. He wasn't happy with me. I can believe that. Mary shook her head. Pa is really a difficult man at times, and Ma, well, I'm really worried about my Ma. She seems to be having trouble with everything. She fears the death of her children so much that it's almost as if some of them have already passed. When I remind her that we're all fine, she doesn't seem to believe me. It's not how I ever wanted to see my mother. He nodded. I don't think my mother would have been able to stand a journey like this. We've been married over a week, and I don't know anything about your family. You know mine because they're here, but I'd like to know about yours. I don't even know if you have brothers or sisters. He took a deep breath. I'm the oldest of six. My pa died shortly after the youngest was born, and ma has been supporting us since. I was old enough to help out on the farm, and I stayed until my next two brothers could take over from me. Charles and Bart are twins, and they're able to run the farm on their own now. I was born and raised in Ohio, and though I loved it there, I've been reading about the Homestead Act and wanting to head to Oregon for a few years now. I finally felt like it was safe to go. What was your father like? she asked. He was a good man. Ma loved him, and she still grieves his death every day. He was a farmer, and he never had any money, but Ma said that he made her feel like she was a queen with the way he treated her. She won't leave the farm, because it was his, so I'm sure my brothers will work there and one of them will inherit. She'll live with one of us until the day she dies. She would never marry another man because her love for Pa was so strong. He almost felt like she would be better off if she remarried, but that wasn't up to him. That's sweet. Bob nodded. Pa loved her the same way. He thought she was the most wonderful woman who had ever walked the face of the earth. He looked at Mary. That's how I see you, I have to say. It is? Mary looked at Bob with surprise. But I'm not late alike, and I don't really like to do any women's chores. I just like to hunt. So? He caught her arm and turned her to him. I don't love you for the way you act. I love you for who you are deep inside. I've seen you with the children who have lost parents. You say that it's Hannah who wants to do for others, but you're always right there beside her. Mary didn't know how to respond to him, so she stepped toward him and wrapped her arms around him, kissing him just like he'd taught her. Later she'd figure out what to say to him. For now? For now, she'd make love with her husband, who made her feel special. 
he made even the deaths on the trail more tolerable. Chapter 8 April 28, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 We're following the Platte River, and I have to say it was a sight for sore eyes. It's a wide one, and knowing we will eventually need to cross it is a bit frightening. I hope Bob isn't the one to swim across, to get rafts next time. I'm not ready to be left a widow, no matter how much I protested marrying him. Bob told me he loves me yesterday evening, and I had no idea what to even say to him. Should I lie and say the same back to him, or what? I finally just kissed him and let him take it from there. Soon, I'll have to give an answer though, and I'm dreading that day with all my might. My mother seems to be losing her mind. She spends every minute afraid of losing all of her children, and she is even calling our trek through the prairie to Oregon a death march. She said the Oregon Trail has been misnamed, and I worry for her. Pa doesn't seem to care how she feels at all. I worry so much that she won't be able to finish the journey because of a fragile mind. As much as they had all been glad to see the Platte River, they now had to walk along it every day. Even Mary was getting sick of the river, though there were many different sorts of animals to shoot along it. They were halfway through their day on Tuesday when there was a shout to stop. And many more shouts. Mary looked at Hannah. Have you got the children? I think one of us needs to go. At Hannah's nod, Mary started running to the wagon way in the back with the man standing there, yelling. What's wrong, Mr. Clavin? She was only a bit out of breath. Is it the babe? Mr. Clavin's wife had looked like she was going to explode with the baby within her since before they'd left independence. It was the couple's first child, and she knew Mr. Clavin was nervous, but women had babies on the trail every day. Yes, it's the baby. Get the doctor. Find a midwife. Mary laughed and patted Mr. Clavin on the arm. My ma delivered a lot of babies back home. Do you want a doctor or a midwife? Both. Mary smiled and stuck her head into the back of the wagon, where she was sure Mrs. Clavin was resting. She knelt next to the woman who had to be two years younger than she was. Would you rather have a doctor or a midwife help you through this birth? A midwife, please. Women need to help women through this, and doctors have no place in childbirth. Mrs. Clavin looked very calm to Mary. How long have you been having pains? Only a couple of hours. I told Peter that we could keep going all day and not even mention it until tonight, but he started shouting. Mary smiled. Isn't that just like a man? She climbed back down. I'm going to go get my ma, and she'll come back here and help you out. And you too, the woman asked, her eyes pleading. My usual role is to stay with all the children in camp while more qualified people deal with things like childbirth. Are you sure you want me to be part of it? Mary asked. Yes, please. All right then, Mary said. Inside she was shaking, but if the woman wanted her help, she'd get it. If I'm about to help you birth that baby, you need to tell me your first name. I'm Mary. I'm Sharon. All right, Sharon. I'll be back in just a moment with someone who knows how to help you. Mary smiled at Mr. Clavin, who looked as if he'd seen the ghost of Jesus Christ himself. She's going to be all right. Of course, Mary had no idea if she was telling the truth or not, but it did seem to be the right thing to say. He nodded and sank to the ground, right there behind the family wagon. Mary walked to her mother, who was sitting in the back of the wagon her father drove with Annie. Jeremiah had been walking again. Ma, Mrs. Clavin is about to have her baby. She needs you. Her mother shook her head adamantly. No more children need to be on this death march. Tell her to cross her legs. Ma, I'm not going to tell a woman in labor to cross her legs. You stop being selfish and get down here and help her. There's no one else to do it. Her ma was taking things too far if she wasn't willing to help a woman in labor. 
there's the doctor. Fetch, the doctor. Ma sat stubbornly refusing to move even a muscle. No, because she wants a woman to help her. This is her first baby. I can't believe you're refusing to help her. What if it was me on the trail, and you weren't with me? Wouldn't you want someone to help me? Mary didn't know what else to say to get her mother to move, and she prayed that would be enough. I would. Her mother looked disgusted, but she got out of the wagon. Where is she? Mary took her back to the Clavens' wagon, and her mother climbed in the back. She wants me here too, Ma, but there's nothing I can do. Her mother skewered her with a look. If I'm here, then you're going to be here too. Get up here. There was no way Mary was going to get out of helping with the birth, despite the fact that she'd rather be anywhere else on earth. Mary wanted to turn and run back to Hannah, but she couldn't. She heard sounds around them as they stopped the wagons for the day and set up camp. Mary held the hand of Sharon, while her mother checked to see if she was close to ready to give birth. We've got hours yet. Mary, tell her husband to have someone boil water. It'll give him something to do so he's not interrupting. Mary giggled but called down the message to Mr. Clavin, who ran for someone to start some water. He looked like there was a bear running after him, he ran so fast. The captain came down and demanded to know what was happening, and Mary told him the train wasn't moving until the baby was born, and she didn't care what he thought about it. There's been enough death on this trail. We need new life, and that's what we're working on in here. Mary knew he'd hate being told that they refused to move that way, but he had to understand. They'd stopped for half a day for his wife's death. The captain looked like he wanted to argue, but he walked away, shaking his head instead. Mary did little to actually help with birthing the baby, but she and her mother ate the food Margaret brought to them, and then they waited some more. When the baby was finally ready to be born, Ma told Sharon to push, and Sharon laid back, whimpering. I'm too tired. Ma got down right into Sharon's face. You're not too tired. You have a sacred duty to bring a child into this company. We've only had death and injuries so far, but a baby, well, a baby would give us all hope again. Give us hope, Sharon. Mary helped hold Sharon up while Ma got down between her legs. When the babe slid into her Ma's hands, she gave it a solid thwack on the bottom. You have a beautiful little boy, Sharon. Sharon was so tired, but she looked at the baby, and her eyes filled with tears. Peter wanted a boy. Men always want boys, Ma said. I'm going to clean him up, and then we'll introduce him to his papa. How would that be? Sharon nodded and Ma told Mary what she needed to do and how she needed to do it. While Sharon lay quietly waiting for them to finish with her, the babe was cleaned and the afterbirth was delivered. Mary helped Sharon change into a clean nightgown, and when Peter came to the back of the wagon to peer inside, he saw only his wife, looking as beautiful as ever with a baby in her arms. Ma and Mary got down out of the wagon and gave the little family some privacy. I sure hope someone cooked tonight, Ma said. I'm hungry. Mary looked over at her mother, who seemed to be back to her normal self. I had no idea a birth was so beautiful, Ma. I understand now why you always went when you were needed. A woman always needs to help the women around her, Ma said. I hope you remember that when you're in Oregon and your neighbor needs help. Those were words she'd always heard from her mother so it had been strange when her mother had initially refused to help. I will. Thank you for showing me what to do. Ma nodded, and the two of them followed their noses to the supper Hannah and Margaret had made together. The music was already playing in celebration of stopping early that day. The only one who looked disappointed was the captain, and Ma marched right up to him. We have a precious new baby boy who was born to this company. I don't care if your schedule wasn't followed for one day. You can march us half to death tomorrow to make up for it. But today, we did what needed to be done for that new mama and that baby. 
She didn't wait for the captain to respond, but she walked over to sit with Mary. That's exactly what he needed to hear, Ma, Mary said, smiling as she took a bite of the rice and beans that had been prepared. And we're having dancing tonight. Maybe you should talk Pa into going out there and dancing with you. It would be good for you. Mary remembered how much her mother had always loved dancing, and she wanted to see her kicking up her heels again. I'm an old woman now, Mary. I can't dance. Her mother shook her head. You were 15 when I was born, which means you're only 37 years old. You need to dance with your husband. Ma tilted her head to one side and thought about it. You know, I may just do that. Mary watched as her mother finished two bowls of beans, and then she checked on her injured children. When she was finished with that, she went straight to her husband and told him it was time he danced with her. She'd gone on a death march for him so he could dance for her. It was not even beginning to be a fair trade, but she might be able to forgive him for putting her children in danger if she could enjoy a dance or six. Ma was loud enough, Mary knew half the camp had heard it, and she was thrilled. It was time for her ma to stand up for herself once and for all. Shortly after her parents started dancing, Bob claimed her hand and started spinning her around. When Ma told Mary they needed to calm their fool selves down and stop trying to kill everyone around them, Mary knew that her mother was back again. Gone was the constant grief, and in its place was pleasure with life. Her Ma had needed to help that baby be born as much as Sharon had needed to have it. They danced later into the night than they should have with having to leave early the following morning, but Mary was happy. There was a new child born into the company, and even more importantly, her ma had remembered to live again. No one could take a day of celebration away from them. Asterisk. When they started the following morning, Sharon walked with Mary and Hannah, helping them herd all the small children whose mothers couldn't walk with them. What did you decide to name him? Mary asked. Josiah. Sharon kissed the head of the baby. Mary had helped her fashion a long piece of cloth in order to fasten the baby to her chest, and it made it easier for her to carry him. No new mother wanted to leave her child in a wagon while she walked, and Mary had done the same thing for her mother so she could work around the house more than once. Asterisk. The next few days everything felt happier. Most of the ill were feeling better, and Mary's ma was herself again. Mary was pleased as well, enjoying dancing and taking walks with her husband when the time allowed. Hannah and Mary played games with the children every day, because the children were better behaved that way. Sharon walked with them, and even took turns spelling Mary's ma so she could be out walking as well. Riding in the wagons was difficult for anyone because of how bouncy the ride was. Mary happened to know that her ma wanted to lose her breakfast on some of the days, so it was nice when she could get down and walk with the rest of them. The Platte River was huge, and the valley it made was a strip of grass for the oxen. They were so happy to have water which made it so they were always able to wash. The weather was getting warmer, and Mary and Bob would sneak away late at night, and they would wash in the river when no one was looking. It seemed to Mary that Bob didn't have a serious bone in his body. He enjoyed playing and lovemaking and dancing. And eating, of course. He was always trying to pull Mary away from her duties and get her to go for a walk or a swim, or something that kept her from helping her ma as much as she thought she should. Ma seemed to be on Bob's side. Go and have fun, Mary. When the babies start coming, there's less time. Enjoy it while you can. One night after her mother had told her that when she went to help with the dishes, Mary was shaking her head as they left camp. Ma is determined that I'll have as many children as she does. I don't know why she can't understand that I don't really want children. She didn't understand why her mother was so intent on sending her off to make love with Bob. Did she want to be a grandmother perhaps? Bob frowned. Don't you think it would be nice for us to have a baby that was half you and half me? Mary shrugged. Not if it's a girl. 
What do you have against girls? Bob asked. Sometimes it seemed that Mary didn't realize she was a girl. She had her musket over her shoulder and was ready to shoot if necessary. She always did. I don't have anything against girls, but I feel bad for them. Women are expected to work much harder than men are. It truly wasn't fair. He frowned, looking at her. What do you mean by that? Well, think about it. When we've talked about homesteading together, the assumption is always that we'll work side by side, and then we'll go home, and I'll spend the evening cooking and cleaning. And women never get a say, Mary continued. Now that we're married, if I say I want to move back to Missouri, you have every right to tell me we're staying in the West, and society expects me to obey your every whim, because I'm a woman. It just doesn't seem right to me. Bob frowned. I've never really looked at things that way, but I hope you know, if you do want something like that, I'm always willing to discuss your feelings and opinions. I do know that about you, but the thing is, if you decide that you want to stay, my opinion no longer matters. Women don't get to vote, and no one even considers giving women the vote. Why not? Am I not as capable as you to learn about the political issues and decide what I want to see done in my country? Is that such a preposterous idea? I happen to believe I'm an intelligent, thinking person. Why can't I learn the issues just like you do? Do women even want to vote? He asked. Doesn't the man vote for the whole family? He truly didn't understand her problem with the situation. He wanted to, but she wasn't making sense to him. Well, think about it. If I like one man for president, and you like another, when you go to vote and represent our family, who will you vote for? You'll vote for the man you think is best, because you think it's the right thing to do. What if I feel just as strongly, the other man is best? I don't get to just vote for both of us and make it my opinion. That's a right reserved for men. Mary didn't even know if she wanted to vote, but she felt like the fact that she was a woman shouldn't keep her from being able to. Bob nodded. I see what you're saying. I'm going to do my best to always care about your opinions, and if you want a girl to be able to work on the farm, I am more than fine with that. I'm even fine with teaching boys to cook and do dishes. We will raise all of our children to be able to do everything whether they are boys or girls. Bob was sure that would make her feel better. Why wouldn't it? It seemed to be exactly what she wanted. And if we do that, when we send them out into the world, will they have unrealistic expectations? They'll go around thinking they can do anything men can do, and society will tell them differently. That's not fair to them, because they'll have a form of freedom that will be quickly taken from them no matter what they do. Bob stopped walking and turned to Mary. So, what is your answer to the dilemma? Everything I suggest you don't like but there has to be an answer that will make girls feel equal. Mary sighed. I don't have an answer. I want to, but nothing really makes sense to me. I want a girl to experience freedom, but when she marries, all that freedom will be taken from her. Now you understand why I was against marrying. I wanted the freedom to stay with me, and I didn't want to have to become subservient to a man. Do you realize that if Captain Bedwell had listened to his wife when she told him she wasn't well, she never would have died? He might as well have pulled the trigger and killed her himself. She died a horrific death because he was determined to make her be strong. Bob nodded. He didn't like admitting it, but his pretty little wife was right. Life wasn't fair for women, and he had no idea what he could do about it, if anything.